Hello everybody, you're listening to the Archer on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dan Cobain. This is the weekly radio show where we chat about the local arts news. We have a different guest on each week. We head over to the Rye Light Zone for a short story and or some poetry. We play local, unsigned and or independent music. And we catch up with Twanglin' Jack Ford over in the Oak Shed for a weekly album review. As always, you can find us on Facebook. If you search for the Art Show on Wickham Sound, you should be able to find us. We're also repeating on Wickham Sound on Monday nights. We're on the Wickham Sound Listen Again, iTunes, Spotify and wherever else you get your podcasts. Please do leave us a short review on your podcast platform of choice if you want to get in touch with me here at the studio you can drop me a line on dane.cobain at wickhamsound.org.uk and this is part one of uh, the latest sort of new short story we're going to be having I say short story it's basically a novella called Insomniac by myself Dane Cobain we are going to head over to the Rye Light Zone for the first part of part one Insomniac part one Insomnia week one day one Kate's alarm clock rang out like it always did at 5.55am. She gave it exactly five seconds and then slammed her hand down three times in quick succession to silence it. She counted to 55 and then sat upright at precisely 5.56. The next 34 minutes had to run like clockwork. There was a routine and bad things happened if she broke it. Bad things also happened when she didn't break it, but that was beside the point. Kate brushed her teeth. Flushed them and brushed them again, then hopped into the shower until 6.15 when she climbed back out and wrapped herself in an Egyptian cotton towel before brushing, flossing and brushing again. She walked back through to her bedroom, pulled on the clothes that she'd selected the night before and sat down at her dresser to brush her hair. She looked at herself in the mirror and took a mental inventory. Uneven face, wonky nose, freckles spread slapdash across her body, upper teeth hanging out and over her bottom teeth. But on the plus side, the girls at Rush got her hair right and the new conditioner was working wonders on the split ends and the knots and tangles. Kate was in the minority, a member of the small group of women who didn't love their bodies and who didn't really want to. To Kate, her body was just a shell, an ungainly frame for her to hang designer clothes from while she entered data into a computer terminal day after intolerable day. That day was a Tuesday, which meant four more working days until the weekend. She had plans, big ones. She'd moved house a couple of weeks earlier and she'd set this weekend aside to unpack her books and DVDs and to sort them into alphabetical order. She had a lot of books and DVDs. But at 6.30am she had something else on her mind. She was dressed and ready to go, although she planned to do her makeup in the car park as she usually did. As soon as the clock hit half past, she was ready for her final check before leaving the house. She started upstairs, moving from room to room and checking the windows and doors. She worked anti-clockwise and checked each of the deadbolts twice, then closed each of the doors one by one behind her. She brushed her teeth again, rinsed out the sink, flushed the toilet, washed her hands, cleaned out the sink and checked the taps were off. Then she headed downstairs and began the routine all over again. It took her 15 minutes to finish the checks. Luckily, she'd allowed for it. Kate hated being late. You're late, Mr Murray said. Mr Murray was Kate's boss at the department store, a petulant little man who was notoriously inflexible when it came to tardiness. I'm sorry sir, Kate said, there was traffic on the A404. I know, Murray replied, most people turned off and took the side roads, but not you. Why is that? Kate shrugged. I have a routine, she said. There's a route, what's the point of having a route if you deviate? Mr Murray sighed and said, that's not good enough, you're going to have to work late to make the time up. Kate nodded and said nothing, but inside her body, her heart was racing and trying to catch up with her mind, which was running at 100 miles per hour and rapidly re-evaluating the evening ahead. For most people, an extra 20 minutes at the end of the day wouldn't be a problem. Kate acknowledged the fairness of it, but Mr Murray didn't understand what he was asking of her. Everything had a time and a place, and an extra 20 minutes at the office would put her 20 minutes behind schedule. That was 20 minutes that she'd have to catch up somewhere else by skipping a shower or dodging dinner. What about if I work through lunch, she asked. Mr Murray smiled a smile that reminded her of a hungry shark as it eyed up a diver. Work through lunch, he said, and then catch up your time at the end of the day. But that's not fair. Life isn't fair, Mr Murray said. Get to it. And so Kate got to it, and she kept her head down at her desk until the end of the day. She'd hoped that if she got everything done, then the boss would let her leave on time, and she was suffering from sharp pangs of anxiety in her head and hunger in her stomach because she'd skipped lunch for the first time in several months. She made up the 20 minutes and then some, and she spent the waning hours of the workday watching the clock and waiting for something else to come in. She packed her bag up and shut her computer down at 5.28, ready to leave at 5.30, but no such luck. Mr Murray bore down on her at 5.29 and asked her where the hell she thought she was going. Home, sir, she said. Her heart was fluttering like an angry bluebird as it fled the nest. Not until I say so. But I work through lunch, she protested, and I have nothing left to do. Then you'll sit at your desk until you've learned your lesson, the boss said. 
Not for the first time, Kate asked herself why she'd ever accepted the job. I wasn't born to crunch numbers in some badly ventilated heap, she thought. But she knew that the boss had won. She needed the job. No, not the job. She needed the money. But I had plans tonight, she murmured. It was true. She had plans every night. The same plan, but a perpetual plan nonetheless. You're just going to have to reschedule, Mr. Murray said. Sorry, Kate. The company comes first. Kate got home at 7.45pm, a full 50 minutes behind schedule. It had been a bad day and she wondered whether she'd brought it on herself by breaking her routine. But it all came back to the traffic and there was nothing to be done about that. Traffic was just one of those random, messy, chaotic parts of life that she had no control over. She didn't like the traffic. By 9.20 she'd cooked dinner, devoured it, washed the plates, dried them, washed the plates again, dried them again and stacked them neatly away in the cupboards. Then she'd taken another shower before sitting down for precisely half an hour to read her book. She spent the last year or so reading through Stephen King's bibliography in chronological order, and she was up to Rose Madder, which was just okay. But then, she wasn't reading for the fun of it. She was reading because it was the right thing to do. That night, she went to bed at 11.45pm, a full hour later than usual, but she couldn't sleep. She tossed, turned and tossed again, but it remained elusive. Her mind was racing, and so was her heart. They beat a dull rhythm that throbbed in her eardrums until she was tapping along on her bedside table. She got up for an hour and tried to read some more, but she couldn't fall back into the fiction, and she found herself dozing off on the sofa. Her eyes were closing, but her mind stayed open. She went back to bed at 2.45am, but sleep remained elusive. Week 1, Day 5 Kate was shattered. It had been a long, unpleasant week, and Mr Murray had continued to take his displeasure out on her. She'd seen it happen before, but never to her. Once a target was on his radar, he honed in on them and made their working life so unpleasant that most of them quit within a couple of months. But Kate wasn't going to do that. She wasn't going to give him the satisfaction. Besides, there was something else on her mind. It was the first Saturday of the month, and the first Saturday of the month was inked in black inside her diary. It was the only time that her family got together to eat dinner, and it was the highlight of an otherwise monotonous existence. But there was a problem. She was so tired that she could barely lift her head. Over the last few days, she'd maxed out at three or four hours of sleep, and the rest of her time in bed had largely revolved around inventing newer and more exotic ways to kill Mr. Murray. Her favourite was the fantasy where she crushed his head in a vice, but she knew full well that she'd never carry the threat out. Nevertheless, spending the night daydreaming and left her drained and lethargic, and she could barely bring herself to look in the mirror. She got out of bed for long enough to make a cup of coffee, but her hands were shaking as she carried it back through to the bedroom. Her stomach twisted and growled apprehensively, and bile rose up in the back of her throat. For a moment, she was convinced she was about to vomit, and she dry heaved right there and then in the middle of the bedroom floor. But nothing came out, and Kate managed to calm it down for long enough to grab a bucket from beneath the kitchen sink and to pour herself a glass of water. She took them both back through to the bedroom, then rifled through a handbag for some aspirin. Then she swallowed the pill, closed the curtains, and climbed back beneath the covers. This wasn't part of the plan, but the plan was falling to pieces. Besides, she was shattered. Not just tired, absolutely shattered, so exhausted that her body hurt. Kate groaned and rolled over in her bed, then reached for a phone on the bedside table. She squinted at the screen, the harsh light half-blinding her and sending flares of pain to her temples. She turned down the brightness and held the device away from her, then blasted out a short SMS to Lauren, her older sister. Can't come, it said. Having a mental health day. Sorry. She pressed the send button and closed her eyes, then forgot all about it until her phone pinged with a reply. She lifted her head up for long enough to read it. No problem. Take as long as you need. Hope you're okay. Kate felt a tear in her eye and brushed her wrist impatiently against it. The moisture left a trail on her hand like the snails in the garden left across her patio. She looked down at her hand, disgusted, and forced herself to climb out of bed. Then she walked through to the bathroom to wash and disinfect herself. Kate spent the rest of the day lying in bed in her pyjamas. She watched Netflix for a while until her eyes hurt too much to hold them open, and then she listened to it with her head beneath the pillow until her ears hurt too much to listen. Then she turned it off and lay there as still as she possibly could. Her head was still swimming, and the room started spinning if she tried to lift it up. That was when her anxiety started to flare up. It spoke with an inner voice that had a brummy accent, and Kate thought she knew why. It was her grandmother's voice, reaching out beyond the grave to tell her what she was doing wrong with her life. Clearly even death hadn't stopped her from having an opinion. You're a silly, useless little girl, it said. I was always ashamed of you. Can't say I blame myself. Look at you lying there in the middle of the day while the sun's up outside. I'd hardly know you as my own flesh and blood. But Grandmama, Kate wanted to say. It's not my fault. I had a plan, Grandmama. 
But of course the plan didn't work out and now she couldn't sleep. She couldn't sleep during the day and she couldn't sleep at night. It was Saturday afternoon, heading into Saturday evening, and she had to be back at work on Monday. Alrighty, so that was the first part of Insomniac by myself, Dan Cobain. You're listening to the Arch on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound, and this is Emotional Warning by Humans Can't Reboot.
That was Live Our Dreams by Umar Ara, and before that we had Emotional Warning by Luke Humans Can't Reboot. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dan Cobain. And it's time now for us to be joined by this week's guest, who is Colourful Cat from Colourful Cat Designs. The first question uh, is actually one I ask everybody. It's my traditional opening question. You may or may not have an answer to this. It's, uh, what was the last book that you read, and what did you think of it? Okay, so the last book I read was... um... And this is going back a few years because I hardly ever read books. <laughs> um, the Star of the Sea by Joseph O'Connor. Mm-hmm. Um, he's actually Sinead O'Connor's brother. Um, yeah. And I was recommended the book. I was over in Ireland. I was visiting my sister-in-law and her partner and... Um, and they were reading the book and I sort of picked it up there and, and then I came back to England and I had to buy my own copy to finish it off. Um, and it's set in, in Ireland in 1847 and it's about people fleeing the famine and getting on a ship and going mm. to America and there's all these different characters and all these different little scenarios that are going on. Oh, the next question is, um, if you could tell us what is Colourful Cat Signs and how would you describe your work? So I do um, traditional hand-painted signs. Um, right, yeah, it's all, it's all hand-painted, basically. So, and like, I sketch out the letters by hand. It's all sort of hand-drawn and hand-painted. And I use yeah. traditional kind of sign-writing techniques. So I just do all sorts of different yeah. kind of signs and lettering-based artwork, um, whether that's for shops pubs you know commercial um businesses or also for private households like house signs or interior artwork you know you've you i saw you've worked with some pretty big names as well so like urban outfitters and mns and things um who are some of the the bigger clients that you've worked with okay so those were i used to work as um a visual merchandiser stroke Mm -hmm. window display artist. So when I was working for like Urban Outfitters, Topshop, Miss Selfridge and all those big sort of high street brands, that was as a visual merchandiser and was Urban Outfitters where I was the visual merchandising manager in the Covent Garden store. And this is going back to the sort of early 2000s. And it was very much, um, I did a lot of stuff like painting on the windows, painting furniture, doing murals, you know, as well as making really cool window displays. Um, so I've, I've got, I left that because I became pregnant and I had twins and then sort of focused on bringing up a family and, yeah. and then, I didn't go back into that kind of work and then I sort of got into sign writing. But yeah, more I recently, that... I helped out J.B. Carter, J.B. Um, Carter Steam Fair. I was going to just build on that and say, I suppose, um, you know, the visual merchandising thing kind of leads into the sign writing anyway. I suppose, you know, they're different disciplines, but I suppose there's a little bit of crossover between the two, right? Oh, yeah, sure. Because it's all about doing something that's really visually appealing that people are going to eye catching it's going to draw people in so Mm -hmm. yeah a sign above a a shop window or a big window splash it's going to attract customers that's what you want is to to sort of shout out your message and Mm -hmm. and let people know about you so yeah it's very much along the same lines really um, it's just that sign writing is is going a bit more kind of specific. <laughs> yeah, and you were you were about to tell me then. So you worked with a, a, a steam fed, did you say? Right. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So you might know about Carter Steam Fair. They they toured around Buckinghamshire and Berkshire for many years. Um, mm-hmm. It's a traditional old vintage steam fair. Um, and he he actually he's he's sold the fair now. He's um, yeah. The last tour that they did was in 2022, 
um, and I helped out at the beginning of 2022 with um, painting some of them to go out on tour because they're always out taking the fair, bringing it, building it up and taking it down and traveling around. It needed constantly to be maintained and, and repainted. So yeah, that was really exciting doing um, that gig. Yeah. Well, and I, I read, I think on your website that you you have a like a love for traditional fairground, circus and uh, canal art. And I wondered how, how that yeah. love came about. Um, I guess from going quite a few years back, I I um after after I left school and I went to art college for a bit and then I um I sort of went off traveling um and ended up in Southern Ireland. Um mm. I lived in a bus and we traveled around all the festivals and fairs around Ireland and I got into the I had a lot of friends in horse drawn that lived in horse drawn wagons and I just loved that sort of vibrant gypsy folk art with all the scroll work and stuff and that's that's kind of where that started and then I moved back to the UK having travelled around Southern Ireland for a few years um, and I had a friend that bought a narrow boat and, and lived mm -hmm. in Aylesbury on the basin and um, I taught myself to do the traditional canal roses um, and ended up painting like this is my friend Jim asked me to paint a load of canal roses on his boat so I completely decorated it with all these swags of roses um yeah and then from that I got a job someone saw me doing that and asked me to redo their pub sign um and then I didn't kind of go carry on sort of full-time sign writing because I then um went back to university and I studied a degree in interior design which took three mm -hmm. years and then when I graduated I began working in window display and visual merchandising so that's kind of what I did then for the next 10 years or so until I had children and yep. started a family. Cool um, and you know obviously with your name Colourful Cat you use a lot of uh, bright colours in your work what attracts you to using them? Is it, is it just to get people's attention with a sign or, you know, is there something about bright colours in and of themselves that you really enjoy? Um, yeah, I just love bright colours. It's just cheerful, okay. isn't it? It cheers you up. Yeah. Colour is really important. It, the way it affects our mood. Um, and it's, you know, and it, it comes again from that kind of, that circus and fairground style is always yeah. really colourful and, you know, even garish. Um, yeah, I love that. And, it, and it's kind of, it's a play on my sort of, my colourful life, because I've done a lot of colourful things, things in my past. <laughs> You're listening to the Archer on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain. I'm here in conversation with Kat from Colourful Cat Designs. And this is Off Party with All To You.
That was all to you by Off Party. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain. And it's time for us to be rejoined in conversation now by this week's guest, who is Kat from Colourful Cat Designs. And I wanted to ask you about, I guess, calligraphy more in general. Um, as an art form, do you think, is it is it a dying art form or is it enjoying kind of a resurgence? Because obviously today with so much stuff being done on computers, um, I suppose it could be easy for it to go extinct, but... Do you think it's it's still growing, still um, you know, innovating? I think there's a really big movement of of um, people that taken up science. There's a lot of groups online, pointed pen calligraphy and brushing. I think people want to do it as a mindful activity, um, mm. or just you know, people want to get back to that using their hands and just to create something really beautiful. Um, there's a lot of graphic designers I know who, you know, all their work has been very computer based, but they're just really keen to get off the screen and do something more hands on. And yeah. I think it's great because it's it's there's something about the hand made that's got a lot more character and soul to it. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and what are some of the tools of the trade that you use? Um, and maybe because I, I think you, I read that you do hand painting, surface and glass gilding. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about uh, each of those and the tools that you use. OK, yeah. So. Um, so with the hand painted signs and I've got my my brushes that I, I mainly use chisel brushes. Um, I've, mm -hmm. got, I've got quite a big select. I've got a huge selection actually <laughs> of different brushes. I've got my go to ones my um, Sable 2112s that I love to use, um, um, you know, and different from really kind of quite small ones going to really big brushes, wide ones. Yeah. Um, um, and I've got a kit box, my sign writing kit box, my one shot paints or craft master paints I use as well. Um, I've got a mall stick, which is, it's like a long stick that you use to, <laughs> to, to kind of lean on to, to steady your hand when you're painting. Yeah, cool. Um, so that's my basic kit is my brushes, um, my paints, white spirit to clean the brushes um, and the mold stick. Um, and then when I do gilding, I also use gold leaf. Um, so you asked about surface gilding might be where you you're painting onto a surface um and you use something called size which is an oil based it's kind of like a varnish and it stays mm -hmm. it it doesn't it it dries really slowly so um you paint that where you want the gold leaf to stick to and you'll <laughs> paint it on onto an area and then it, after a few hours it goes kind of really tacky um, and it's yeah. just got to be the right kind of tackiness and then you put your gold leaf onto it and it sticks and then you you sort of burnish it off make it nice and shiny and it's it's just it's just stunning it's just nothing like this shine of gold um so that's really nice i've just been doing some actually on a, a house sign um which I will be sharing on my Instagram <laughs> um, when I've given it to the client um, yep. shortly. Um, and then the reverse glass gilding is where you apply gold leaf to the back of the glass so that um, all the work's kind of done back to front on the back of the glass. Yep. And you, you would use a sort of, well, you can use different types. You, there's a water size that you use to apply the gold. So you put this, this water-based size onto the glass and then the gold sticks on there. Um, and then you back it up with paint on the areas where you want the gold to stay. And it gives a kind of really reflective mirror surface. Or you can also apply like your oil-based size onto the glass and then stick the gold onto there. And that will give you more of a matte finish. Yeah. Um, and there's just lots of different techniques that you can use to get different effects. And um, and I love playing around and just trying out new things. 
Um, at the moment, I'm doing a series of letters, kind of circusy style letters, but yeah. in reverse onto glass, that that will be exhibited next um, February. Yeah, so that's that's the um, reverse glass gilding, which I love to do, and I'm going to be doing more of that in the, in the next year. Yeah. Cool. And you mentioned uh, the house sign you're working on and obviously you, you, you're you available for commission. Uh, what are some of your favourite commission projects that you've worked on? Um, well, just this year, I've done some really nice um, signs for, for small businesses. Um, okay. What's the one? I did one up in Long Crendon. Well, I did two up in Long Crendon. One's for a, a small fashion... Um, Oh, I'm trying to think of the right words. She's a um, sustainable fashion um, yeah. business called Comla. Um, and the other one is it's a zero waste refill shop. Um, oh, yeah. New Deco shop. I did a sign for her. Um, and I sort of used elements. She already had a kind of logo with some leaves on, and then, mm -hmm. and then I, it was just one of those really nice projects where I sort of had free reign, but I used elements of her existing logo, and then I sort of played around with some different ideas and presented them to her. And she loved pink and green together, mm -hmm. which originally the sign was just going to be all in green, and then. Yeah. Um, and then I added pink to it, and it was it was just a really lovely sign. Um, and uh, awesome. she's got that fixed to the outside of her shop wall. That was really good fun. Um, I did a lovely piece in the summer for a, a wedding gift, um, <laughs> which was a reverse glass gilded piece, um, which was all sort of tailored around what the client client liked you know their kind of um their style I'm saying if people yeah. want to hire you how can how can they um so look me up on instagram um in my bio there's a link to my link tree uh well you can just message me directly on instagram <laughs> or from my website um the whatsapp button will pop up um so yeah they're the main ways or on facebook as well message me on there yeah and i think is it in your link um, tree i saw I, I saw people can get a free downloadable alphabet artwork was was that linked into your from your link tree yeah yeah that's the top one so you just go there and you can sign up to my email list i'm not very good at sending out emails i'm trying to get better but i try and do a kind of like either monthly or every couple of months just a little update yeah. about what I've been up to and any new sort of new stuff that I'm doing any exhibitions that are coming up um and I've got this alphabet that I I designed um I sketched it all out and it's kind of a, a variety of different letter forms um that I kind of put all together and then painted it as a poster um mm -hmm. And you can just if you if you go onto that link, it will give you the, the poster for you to download and you can do what you like with it. You can print it off <laughs> and frame it. It's quite a nice little piece of artwork um, or use it for inspiration. Um, You're fairly active in the in the local scene. Um, who are some of the other artists who's who maybe you've worked with and whose work you admire? Um. So I've done, you'll know Dan, Deep Create. Mm -hmm. I, I've worked on quite a few projects with him. Um, so yeah, he's always he's always great fun to work with because Dan's just like, wow, he's so out there and he, he does really amazing murals and artwork all over High Wycombe. And I've collaborated on, on a few things with him for instance under the guild hall in in high wickham he did this big mm -hmm. mural of um sort of high wickham through the ages and i signed wrote he he got me to do the high wickham which is on the electric box next to the mural yeah i know exactly um, what you mean yeah and then i've recently been working with him on a um he's been doing a mural uh at a hospital in oxford 
um, mm -hmm. a music therapy room and I, I did a bit of sign writing for him there recently too. Cool. And then I, I mentioned um, J.B. Carter earlier that I did a bit of work with yeah. as well. Uh, what do you? What is it about your work you think that makes it so recognisable? Because I think when you look at one of your signs or even, you know, when you see one of your Instagram posts in the feed, it's instantly recognisable as your style. Um, what do you think it is that, you know, that defines your style and makes something so recognisable as your work? Um, I don't know. That's interesting, actually. I'm really glad that you feel that, that you can instantly <laughs> recognise it's me. I guess it's maybe it's just the sort of use of colour and I like it to be quite well really eye-catching and to sort of hit you to to be kind of quite vibrant and I use elements yeah. of decorative work like I might stick some canal roses or a bit of scroll work you know some decorative elements to to sort of complement the lettering but I guess, yeah, it's just the use of colour and really sort of eye-catching colour and decorative elements, I, I guess. That's <laughs> what makes it. Cool. Um, and just the last question to end on, and you've, you've mentioned a few of these bits here and there, but um, what have you got planned next? So what, you, what have you got planned for 2024? And where can people follow you to stay up to date? Um, so yeah, as I said, the, the sort of first thing on my agenda that I'm working towards is in February, I think the weekend is the 16th to the 18th of February, I'll be ex exhibiting at Longwick Art Show, um, which is, it, it's in a school and it's been running for quite a few years now and it's been getting bigger every year, so they invite a number of artists, um, to exhibit there over one weekend. Um, so I'll be doing a series of six reverse. Um, and I'm on, I'm free, so I'm trying to work email list, then that's the best way, or just follow me on Instagram. I'm always sort of putting in my stories what I'm up to and, um, and what's gonna be coming up. Yeah, I've just, yeah, and just always drop me a line if you've got any ideas of anything you want, whether it's a, a piece of artwork for your home or yeah. a sign for your business, then I'm always happy to to have a chat and discuss and sort of work around whatever your budget is, doesn't matter how big or small it is, then um, yeah, I'd love to chat because every, every project I do is really different and um and always tailored around whatever you need. Big thank you to Kat from Colourful Cat Designs for joining us. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dan Cobain, and it's time for us to check out some music now. This is The Phenomenots with Giving Up. Well, that's your fault 
That's why I'm calling out your bluff I think you're scared Cause you missed your chance Cause I could have blocked you But now that is in the past Getting up on you You cause nothing but pain Yeah, I'm walking away Don't expect to see me again I'm giving up on you You cause nothing but pain Yeah, I'm walking away Don't expect to see me again Don't come crying when he breaks your heart And don't come to me, you torn mine apart And don't stand Jeff the blame Cause I'm sick and tired of blaming kids Giving up on you, you cause nothing but pain Yeah, I'm walking away See me again, I'm giving up on you 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 You got nothing but play
That was You Shaped Hole by Jordana Blake, and before that we had The Phenomenots with Giving Up. You're listening to The Archer on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain, and it's time for us to head over to the Oak Shed now to catch up with Twangling Jack Ford for this week's album review. Ant music. The very best of Adam and the Ants. In the early 70s, a track called Burundi Black became a minor hit. It took a recording of Burundi drummers and added some rock guitar. It would turn up in adverts. I seem to remember it being used in a flake chocolate ad. Adam and the Ants were part of the mid to late 70s punk scene and were managed by Malcolm McLaren, manager of the Sex Pistols. They were known on the scene, but they were not very successful. Then they split into two bands. One took on a very young girl singer and became Bow Wow Wow, and Adam fronted the other band. Both bands adopted the Burundi drum sound. Bow Wow Wow, with their new lead singer, played light, breezy, melodic African highlife type motives and were moderately successful. Adam and the Ants added a heavy distorted guitar and were very successful. The original Adam and the Ants were a spiky, jerky post-punk band with sharp, clear guitar chords, like a poppier version of Wire or as The Fool might have sounded, had they ever had any fun. They released a relatively successful album called Dirk Wears White Socks before they split. There are some songs by that band on this album. Songs like Car Trouble and Deutsche Girls. Songs I remember hearing on the radio and played by DJs between the acts at the Roundhouse or the Marquee. Adam took the Burundi drum sound and added all kinds of glam rock tricks. The drums of the glitter band, the loud distorted Mick Ronson Ziggy Stardust guitar lines, the catchy melodies, nonsense scat singing and meaningless but evocative lyrics of Mark Bolan. Add on to that some spaghetti western lead guitar and Morricone-esque grunts and chants and you have the first single of the new Adam and the Ants, Dog Eat Dog. Then we got ant music and the guys in my band were tying scarves to their guitars. The whole thing, the drumming and chanting and doing something entirely new and exciting, peaked with Kings of the Wild Frontier. Then we had Stand and Deliver and Prince Charming and it all got very posy. A bit too new romantic for me, with all the hedonistic 80s implications of loads of money, Amex cards, and Bolivian marching powder. Then came Ant Rap, which was rubbish, though it does mention a guy who was in the year below me at school and had given up being the bass player in Roxy Music to join the Ants. Eventually that band split and we thought it was all over, but Adam Ant had one final glorious stand to deliver with Goody Two Shoes. The album finishes with an OK song in an 80s synth pop style and just shows how much the big hits relied on production. For a while, Adam and the Ants resurrected the glam rock of a decade before, where producers like Mickey Most and Tony Visconti made simple songs into wall of sound epics, and you could not help but smile and sing along, qua 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 diddly. Big thank you to Twangling Jack Ford for this week's album review. Thank you to everyone whose music I've shared. As always, you can find us on Facebook. If you search for The Art Show on Wickham Sound, you should be able to find us. We repeat on Wickham Sound on Monday nights. We're on the Wickham Sound Listen Again, iTunes, Spotify, and wherever else you get your podcasts. Please don't hesitate to leave a short review on your podcast platform of choice. You can also find us on Facebook if you search for The Art Show on Wickham Sound. And you can reach out to me here at the studio on dane.cobain at wickhamsound.org.uk. That's D-A-N-E dot C-O-B-A-I-N at wickhamsound.org.uk. So I'm going to leave you with one last tune. This is the incredible Fabulous Parfait with Miss Siri Préféré. I'll catch you next week. Vendredi soir, la tête en